This is Future Based Podcast. Future Based is an interdisciplinary philosophy platform. For more information and our new website, visit futurebased.org. Do I know myself through and through? Is there a clear distinction between myself and the other? Or am I always somewhat a stranger to myself while the other is strangely familiar? During the upcoming lecture, Researcher and philosopher Femke van Hout will address these questions from the perspective of the philosophy of the body. In 60 minutes, she will discuss four thinkers and artists who challenge the Cartesian division between the soul and the body, the self and the other, inside and outside, familiar and strange. Are we not always a bit foreign to ourselves? And what will be the political and ethical consequences of this inherent strangeness within us? This lecture was part of the future-based 60 Minutes Back to the Future series. This is a new online and ongoing series in which we reflect on the bottlenecks and challenges of today's society and the contemporary issues that have already been addressed by numerous philosophers, artists and scientists. What can we learn about the future by looking at history? The structure of the lectures is as follows. In 60 Minutes, an artist, designer, researcher or scientist talks about his or her field of work and what theories and thinkers have influenced their work. We will then reflect on how these theories, ways of thinking and researches are relevant for understanding the state of today's society. What can we learn from them about the now and why it is relevant to involve our past in our speculations about the future? Femke sometimes refers to the visuals in the presentation. However, the lecture is easy to follow without the visual context and therefore we decided to turn her super interesting lecture into this podcast. Hey, welcome. <laughs> um, just a little bit about the lecture. The idea is, is that I will talk for an hour and I will talk about four people there, which is quite a challenge. Uh, I will discuss three philosophers and um, one filmmaker. Um, and during the lecture, they won't, there won't be time for questions, but if you have any questions and you would like to stay after nine o'clock, you're very welcome to. So there we are. The title of my lecture, What a Strange Self. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Sabine for organizing this and inviting me to speak here today. Um, a little bit about myself before. Um, my name is Femke, I think actually most of you already know me. Um, but I uh, do a research master philosophy at the University of Amsterdam and they're focusing mostly on the philosophy of the body and questions on embodiment and identity. And apart from that, I write uh, um, essays for Simedar, which is the little magazine from the uh, Department of Philosophy at the UvA. I provided the link for the website. Um, and at the moment I'm writing my thesis also about uh, the body and identity and I'm writing on how people with uh, chronic illnesses actually try to make sense of their own life and try to tell life stories about themselves. And the idea is that um, people who um, uh, might have chronic illnesses or traumas might have more difficulties with telling this life story and therefore might have more difficulties with defining who they are and uh, knowing where they want to go in life. So that's a bit what I'm doing at the moment. Um, and I am already a bit familiar with teaching about these topics. I did some uh, lectures on events and I finished an internship as a teaching assistant at the UFA in which I taught a first year course um, on research methods on the philosophy of the body. So that's me. Um, about the lecture, um, you already saw it for the, from the title, What a Strange Self. The lecture is basically questioning how, um, who you are or how the self is also always uh, intertwined with the feeling of strangeness or feeling of being a stranger. And that might sound a bit counterintuitive, right? Because what can be more familiar to you than yourself? I mean, that's who you are. Um, Lecture, I will look at how identity is always intertwined with feelings of both familiarity and strangeness. And I will do this from the perspective of philosophy of the body um, and question how we can see the body as something that is central to who we are and that this body that is our own always already contains strange elements. 
Um, and in that way, I want to examine how identity is a sort of constant problem. So it's not a given thing. It's not something that's just already there when you're and you're born with it, but it's something that we need to keep on questioning, basically. Um, the table of contents, uh, I switch it a little bit around. Um, I'm going to start with Jean-Luc Nancy. He's a French philosopher, um, very much associated with postmodernism and deconstruction, also with Derrida and Heidegger. And um, I will discuss a specific essay that he wrote. It's called L'Entru. And it's an essay in which he reflects on the experiencing his own heart transplant and the aftermath of that. Uh, and it's quite a special essay because uh, it's not really normal often that people talk uh, in a philosophical context about such a personal experience. Um, after that, I will go a bit back in time and uh, focus on René Descartes. Um, uh, and I think, as most of you know, uh, Descartes made a distinction between the mind and the body. And I will talk about this and then examine how this might intertwine with a also quite radical division between inside and outside, self and other, familiar and strange. Um, then I will go into Helmut Plessner, uh, who basically criticizes Descartes for this quite radical or fundamental distinction and who says, well, no, maybe we should actually see humans more as embodied beings. So we cannot separate mind and body so radically from each other. And he's also the one who really explicitly says that identity is this problem that will never disappear. And then in the end, uh, I will kind of make it full circle by uh, going back to this essay of uh, Nancy, because uh, filmmaker Claire Denis made a really beautiful movie that is inspired by uh, this essay and basically in this movie she explores the narrative implications of um, of the essay and she basically takes it even further and implicitly and visually the movie asks quite a lot of uh, questions about strangeness and onus and identity and at the end there will be a short reflection and then there will be time for questions. Um, yeah, so uh, Nancy is uh, the first philosopher I want to start with. And he was born in 1940. He's still alive, which is quite nice and also quite special in the philosophic, philosophical world. He still writes uh, essays and responds to things. Um, and he, uh, basically the whole title of this um, seminar I took from him, What a Strange Self. That's something that he explains, uh, exclaims at the end of uh, the essay. Um, so he he uh, talks about this heart transplant that he experienced 10 years before. And he says that this heart transplant prompted him to ask some profound questions on who he is. And in a way, that's not so strange, right? It's, it's, it's very impactful uh, uh, happening. I mean, first and foremost, because it allows you to stay alive in the first place. Um, but not, what Nancy basically says is that this whole heart transplant makes that um, there is a constant feeling of intrusion and a constant feeling of strangeness and a breaking of boundaries. Um, and he starts basically questioning who or what is this intruder or intrusion that I'm experiencing. And uh, intuitively you might say, well, obviously the new heart is an intruder, right? It's a bit of a weird idea that in order to stay alive, you have to receive the heart of another person. You have to receive the heart of somebody who has already died. And Anansi says, stranger, but then he says, well, you know, already when I got the diagnosis and the doctor told me that my heart was not going to make it, that I was basically going to die if something wouldn't happen, I started feeling this strangeness and I started basically questioning like okay if my own heart is going to drop me and let me die in what way is it actually still my own and he started to be a bit disgusted about this whole heart and he describes it as having this improper food on the tip of his tongue that he kind of wants to spit out you know he wants to get rid of this stranger and here you already see that the idea of intrusion or strangeness uh, becomes very interesting because you don't know 
whether it really comes from outside necessarily, but it can also come from inside apparently. And then during this whole essay, he starts basically uh, explaining how in this whole illness process, he's surrounded and invaded by strangers constantly on all kinds of different levels. So firstly, of course, there's the doctors who have to make medical decisions uh, about him, actually have to decide whether it's worth it to give him this heart transplant in the first place. And then there is waiting lists that determine, I mean, he has to be at exactly the right spot at the right time in order to get the heart. Uh, there is decisions that he has to make that uh, loved ones have to make. Um, and then he says, well, I'm constantly being monitored and checked and measured. Um, and basically my body, instead of just being naturally there, starts appearing apart from me. It starts appearing in front of me and all of a sudden it's something that I can analyze. You know, I, I just become to myself an assembly of functions. Um, one of the examples is, for instance, this picture of a heart, right? That's made by this sound imaging technology. But you could also talk, for instance, about getting blood and measuring the blood values, right? If that happens a lot, it might really evoke a feeling of strangeness. But probably the most intense feeling of estrangement is because of his immune system having to basically shut down because uh, the most... A uh, dangerous thing about having an organ transplant in general is that um, your immune system might actually reject the heart. Um, so what he has to do is he has to take medicine, so basically stuff that is strange to his body in order to shut down his immune system. And you could basically say that your immune system is a bit of the the border guard, right, in your body. It determines what belongs there and what doesn't. And now it actually uh, shouldn't work anymore in order to survive. And what happens then is that start waking up. And Nancy says, well, these viruses don't necessarily come from the outside. They were already dormant in my own body, but now that my immune system is so bad, they actually get the chance to make me really ill. And in the end, he even gets cancer because of all these uh, uh, processes. And he says that, yeah, the cancer is actually this manifestation of the stranger in your cell, right? It's this, it's your own cells basically multiplying too much. But um, that actually is, it and makes you in a life dangerous situation. Um, so, What's very interesting about the conclusion that he draws in the end is that he doesn't say, well, you know, first I was just myself and then all these strangers started invading my life and my body and it was terrible and now I hope to be, you know, normal or complete again. But instead he says that this whole heart transplant resulted in a profound change in how he experiences himself. And that leads him to exclaiming at the end, what a strange self. And he says, never has the strangeness of my own identity, which I have nevertheless always found so striking, touched me with such acuity. So basically he says that instead of saying that there's all these strange things intruding, he basically starts thinking that he himself might have always been a bit strange. And that this heart transplant is just a sort of extreme version of the strangeness that is already constantly intruding. I mean, as a living being, you're constantly eating and drinking and breathing. I mean, you constantly are invaded by strangers. You're, I mean, people make decisions about you or you're interacting with other people. So actually, this intrusion is already constantly taking place. But now he becomes very, um, very conscious of that. And he basically says, well, maybe this intrusion or this strangeness is not invading on me, but lies at the core of who I am. And then it becomes the question, so th then who are you then, right? And in the end, he has this uh, quote, that, uh, the, the, this is quoted by a lot of philosophers who read the, the essay, um, because he says, I am the illness and the medical intervention. I am the cancerous cell and the grafted organ. I am the bits of wire that hold together my sternum. 
I'm this injection site permanently stitched in below my clavicle, just as I was already this screws in my hip and this plate in my groin. I am becoming like a science fiction android or the living dead, as my youngest son one day said to me. And what is interesting about this quote is that we are very used to say, uh, you know, I'm Femke and I am ill or I have cancer or I have a transplant. But instead of having, he uses being. So he starts really identifying with all those different weird parts that suddenly invade his body. So basically what he says is that all these different things make up who he is. So... Uh, some philosophers analyze this as him stating that it's identity indifference, that you're only who you are because you actually constantly change and are invaded by, by other things. Um, yeah, so this is uh, an interesting essay because Nancy basically starts questioning who he is because of a profound experience of bodily change. And this is, of course, not strange at all, but in the context of Western philosophy and religion, um, it, it doesn't really fit because often the body is seen as something that is quite separate for, from who we essentially are. You know, if you think about Christianity, you have this idea of the body being this heavy thing and it's kind of this prison or cage for the soul. And then the soul, of course, can only live with this body on this world, but after uh, you die, the soul will basically go to heaven and detach from the body. So in a, who you are essentially can be detached from this earthly body. And a philosopher who also thinks that uh, you and your body can essentially be separated is Descartes, uh, who I will discuss shortly. And then other philosophers like Nancy, but also Helmut Plessner say like, well, no, a body is actually central to what it means to be human. And that makes that we can start asking all kinds of interesting questions about identity. Descartes now. Descartes um, lived in the 16th and 17th century. And I think quite a lot of you might know already about him. So I will discuss it shortly. Uh, Descartes um, was looking for a basis of absolute knowledge. He basically wanted to know something that many philosophers want to know. It's like, how can we know anything at all? I mean, am I not dreaming everything? Uh, and he was basically, um, it was this question like, okay, can I even trust my own eyes? You know, I can all be an illusion. And he started developing this method called methodological doubt, which basically means that he uses doubt as a method. Um, and that actually means that he was just going to question everything he could. So he started with uh, questioning the world around him. He said, well, I'm sitting here by the fire in my chair, and, uh, but I could be dreaming it. That could be possible. So, okay, let's doubt the outer world. And then the next step was, okay, uh, I, I think that I have hands and a face and feet, but I might be dreaming that as well. So the body was also bracketed and doubted. Um, and then he even started doubting mathematical truths, right? He said that, oh, you know, maybe there is no God, but instead there might be an evil genius who makes me think that two and two makes four. But actually, that's not at all the, the truth. Maybe it makes five or something. So he also started doubting all that. And in the end, he had basically doubted almost everything. But the only thing he couldn't doubt, obviously, was that he was doubting. It's not possible to doubt that apparently there is someone doubting right so apparently he must exist as a doubting or thinking experiencing entity and that is what this sentence comes from this cogito ergo sum i think therefore i am uh, and from this truth he basically started building out more like uh, towards the existence of the world but i will skip those steps now um, but what Descartes came to in the end was a sort of idea that there are two substances. The one substance is the res cogitans, or the thinking thing, right? That is the one that comes from this cogito ergo sum. And that is who he is, that is the mind. And the other substance is res extensa, and that's basically everything that is extended. So everything material that has, yeah, basically takes up space in the world. 
And uh, I mean, the table that I'm standing at uh, belongs to that or the computer, but also my body. So basically my body belongs to the whole extended world, basically. And apart from that, he also said, well, the body functions like a machine. Uh, and Descartes was very much influenced by the development uh, on scientific uh, level at the time. I mean, Versalius was drawing all these drawings of uh, the human body, you know, showing that uh, it actually functions like a machine, like, oh, look, guys, the heart is actually a pump and there are nerves and there are vessels in the body. And, um, you know, there's also this uh, illustration of a man having his foot by the fire and it burns and then he just puts his foot away. And that's really shown to be um, uh, a, a mechanism, you know, like a mechanic reaction. Um, so Cartesianism is still very much present in our modern day society, uh, even though lots of us don't really believe in this disembodied mind anymore. Um, and that's mainly because of on the left, uh, called uh, the La Métrie, uh, he developed uh, Cartesian materialism. And the La Métrie basically said, well, they got this whole idea of the body as a machine, that's great, but the idea of a disembodied mind doesn't make any sense. He said, well, you know, even the thinking thing, even the experiencing entity that you're talking about, can be reduced to purely material processes. So in the end, everything can be reduced to these machine-like material processes. And um, I think somebody like Dick Swab, I think most of you might know him, he's this uh, Dutch uh, neuroscientist who wrote this book. There was a big hit called We Are Our Brains. I mean, it says number one international bestseller. Um, and what Dick Swab basically said was things like the Lamitri, right? Like, okay, you know, when you're in love, it's actually just a physical process of all these uh, hormones talking, you know, and he, um, uh, so he very much reduces everything to physical processes. And also what's interesting about the swap is here that he really localizes who we are still very much in the brain. So... Uh, the body still gets quite a passive role for Dick Swab. The body is mostly directed by the brain. So even though he says in the end that everything is material and physical processes, you could still say that there seems to be sort of remnant of Cartesianism there, that there's still this division between the brain and the body as a sort of passive entity that is directed by it. Um, but... Of course, a question that you could ask here is if this is at all a problem. I mean, is it a problem that this Cartesianism or this materialist Cartesianism is still present? Because, I mean, it works quite well. <laughs> um, you see, in medical science, there's a lot of uh, people using these um, uh, maps that look a bit like the ones Versalius would draw. You know, you have here one with the, the vein this whole heart transplant that uh, Nancy is talking about, um, this whole heart transplant that Nancy is talking about is possible in the first place because you actually have, um, you have this knowledge of the heart being a pump, right? His blood flow is literally led around his body, his rib cage is opened and two hearts are being exchanged. Um, I also have this example um, that I think was quite funny. In 2005, there was a, a five-year-old boy uh, and his nose was bitten off by a dog. The dog ate it um, and was then killed by a veterinarian. They got the nose out of the dog's stomach and put it back on the face of the boy. Um, and of, I mean, it sounds a bit uncanny, but the what's interesting here is that clearly the body is some kind of thing that we can attach and detach things from right and that actually works quite well um so but of course there are philosophers who take issue with cartesianism and that's mostly with his quite radical division between body and mind um basically i i try to visualize it in this way basically descartes said well there really two different substances, right? They're two different things. Even though body and mind in daily life interact, they're still uh, very much separated from each other. Um, so on one hand, you have this thing that I am, the thinking thing, and that is disembodied. And on the other hand, the body as a machine. 
And what's interesting here is that you get also a clear division between other things. So the on one hand is the mind, and that's also the subject, right? That's the thinking, experiencing entity, which I am. And on the body and the rest of the world, that's all objects. That's all kind of that material. Um, and with that also comes a clear division between inside and outside. So everything that happens inside my mind, everything I'm experiencing, everything that doesn't belong to there. This division that I list below between psychological and physiological also belongs to that. You see that in medical science too, right? They make a division between psychological complaints and physiological complaints. Uh, even though we know that often things are psychosomatic or very much intertwined. Um, and also, and that's of course very important for this lecture, is that on the one hand, there is this familiar and onus, and the, on the other hand, the stranger. So they are also quite clearly like whoosh, divided. And uh, Descartes also thought that there was a clear um, uh, distinction between human beings who have a body, but they also have a mind and everything else. So according to Descartes, even animals uh, don't have a mind or don't experience anything. I think he even tortured animals to uh, show that they didn't. So he would have this screaming cat and say like, well, it's not feeling anything, you know, it's just, uh, uh, it's just a machine reaction really. So, um, and Plessner takes issue with this. He says that, um, Descartes basically takes something as foundational. Uh, first, I will introduce Plessner a little bit. He was born in 1892 and died in 1985. And Plessner uh, is uh, a philosophical anthropologist who is basically really questioning a lot what it means to be a human being. Um, and he also uses uh, the uh, phenomenological method. Um, and he never got as famous as some people think he deserves to be. And that's also partly because he was a Jew in Nazi Germany who had to flee. Um, so a bit of a tragedy there in that regard. Um, and what Plessner basically says of Descartes is that he says, yes, well, Descartes observed very well that there is this experiencing side and a thing-like side to the body, right? That there, there are two sides and they do exist. But then what Descartes does, as we see, is making two substances of them. He's basically saying, well, they're essentially different things. They are different beings. And Plessner says, well, that actually is not the case. That's actually very problematic. And this subject and object side are not separated, but very much intertwined. If, if we look at living bodies, and that's not only human bodies, but also animal bodies, even plant bodies, you see that they are not purely objects, but they're also not purely disembodied subjects. It's a bit of both. Um, and Plessner basically starts questioning what it means to be a human. And then he says, well, in order to know that, you really have to know what it means to be a living being in general, because that's what humans are essentially. And then he says, well, actually what all living beings share with each other is that they have a changing boundary. Um, if you, for instance, look at this pen, I mean, this pen is separated from it, its environment as well. And uh, the boundary can change too. I mean, I can break it and then, you know, it has a very different boundary. Um, but the difference between this pen and me is that this pen doesn't influence its own boundary at all. Whereas as a living being, I'm constantly interacting with the environment in order to basically constitute my own boundary between myself and the world. Um, and maybe this sounds a bit uh, theoretical, but if you just talk about things like, you know, eating and drinking, then it might become very clear, right? You're constantly taking things from your environment in order to remain yourself, basically. Um, and if you go to a more extreme example, I mean, Nancy's heart transplant could also be uh, seen as part of this, right? I mean, this living being actually can be opened, can receive the heart of another in order to live. So his boundary has to change in order to live at all. And Plessner draws two conclusions from this. He says, well, living beings constantly change. It's a never permanent boundary. 
And secondly, they are ultimately dependent on their environment. So they cannot be separated from it. And therefore he also says a bit like, well, this whole idea of radical doubt of your environment, I mean, you can do that, but at the same time, you're still breathing, right? So you're still, you know, you're still dependent on the existence of that environment that you're doubting. So it's a bit absurd what Descartes is doing over there. Um, and then Plessner basically says, well, of course there is different sides to a body, right? It's experiencing and it's a thing, but we shouldn't call that two different substances. And instead he comes up with the idea of the difference between Leib and the body as a Körper. Uh, those are two, in Dutch we would maybe say uh, Leib and Lichaam. Um, and in English they often translate it as living body and body. Um, and in order to illustrate what it means, I would like you to actually touch one of your hands with the other hand. I can, of course, not see if you do it. Um, but um, this illustrates quite nicely what Lesnar means by this. Because um, on one hand, when you do that, you feel your hand as a physical thing, right? Like I can touch my hand, I can also touch this table or this laptop. I mean, it's a thing in the space. But at the same time, while it's being touched, this hand is also experiencing being touched. So the table has no idea that I'm touching it, right? It doesn't feel it, but my hand actually feels that it's being touched. And there you see the difference between Leib and Körper. Uh, it is a thing, a Körper, but at the same time, it's an experiencing thing, a Leib. And Plessner says, well, that could be called the body that you are and the body that you have. Um, and the life, the body that you are, is, is this experiencing entity. And it's also answering to the situation in the world. And that basically means that as a body, you're constantly confronted with situations in the world, right? I mean, water is offered or somebody might hunt you or somebody might talk to you. You know, so there are constantly situations that you have to answer to, that you actually have to engage with. And that's as a living body, you have to do that all the time. Um, but what is important is that this life is not a disembodied mind, right? I mean, Descartes said, oh, an experiencing thing is not the body. But according to Plessner, if this hand wouldn't be a physical thing, it couldn't feel in the first place. So it really needs to be a physical thing to feel at all, right? So life is never, uh, can never be disentangled for, from the körper, the body as a thing. So the körper is the thing localized among other things. Uh, and it's also an instrument. So I just said that we constantly have to answer to what happens around us, right? We have to answer to situations in the world. And in order to do that, I can use my own body as an instrument. So I can walk to the other person or I could talk to the other person. I mean, I'm talking to you now. And while doing that, the body that I am is using the body that I have to talk to you guys. So in that way, the körper is constantly used uh, as, as basically as an instrument. Um, and I made, again, a bit of a visualization to show how this whole idea of how Descartes and Plessner think differently and how that has a different effect on how familiarity and strangeness is being thought. So, you know, as we saw, Descartes has this disembodied mind versus the body and the, and the mind side, there's the familiar, familiarity and on the body side, there is the strangeness. Plessner basically says, well, no, you don't have two substances. It's just one living body, but they have two aspects. So there has a life aspect, the experiencing part and the körper aspect, the body is a thing or instrument. And then Plessner says that as humans, we can only live when we find the balance between those two. So when we find the balance between both having and being a body, and that's basically something we constantly have to do. We constantly have to find this balance. And this ties up with this feeling of familiarity or strangeness. Um, 
basically Plesner says, when we find a balance between the two, we feel very much at home in the world. And it's important to say that this balance is most often found, right? Most often we are fine, <laughs> we are, it's going great. Um, and a really simple example could be walking. I mean, when I'm walking and it goes well, I'm just using my body in a way and I'm not even conscious of it. It just feels great and I feel very much at home. Uh, dancing could be another example. Um, playing a music is a really good example. I mean, people who can play an instrument very well at a certain moment might even be able to play a melody with their eyes closed, right? And it, nothing feels more familiar to, uh, than being able to do that, actually. Um, but if there is a disbalance, then a sort of feeling of strangeness is being involved. Uh, and then um, a really good example here is by stumbling, right? So you're walking, you're feeling great, and then all of a sudden you stumble. And then all of a sudden the balance kind of shifts, you know? You're confronted with the fact that your body is a thing that can actually stumble into other things. Um, learning a new skill is a, another really good example, of, especially for people who do a lot of sports. Uh, if you would describe it in terms of Plesner, you would say that somebody who is trying to, you know, uh, learn sports or learning to play an instrument, they're basically trying to find a new balance between using their body, that the body that you are using, the body that you have. And basically, at, a cer at the first, it feels really strange when you're trying out uh, a new skill. But after a while, you actually... Uh, start feeling very familiar because you actually know how to do it. Your body starts getting used to the task. Um, and the last uh, uh, example in which a feeling of strangeness by feet might be invoked is getting ill um, because then all of a sudden your, your körper, your body as a thing, doesn't work the way it should anymore. And that's something that Nancy also notices, right? And that's why he feels strange from his own heart. It's basically this heart should just be bouncing. I mean, you shouldn't even be noticing that it that is there, right? And then all of a sudden it's not working and the doctor's going to tell you like, no, you're going to die if this goes on like that. So um, basically you're confronted with this ultimate strangeness because the balance is like totally uh, shifted all of a sudden. And... For Nancy, this whole heart transplant and the illness prompts him to ask questions about who he is, right? It prompts him to actually start reflecting on who he is. Um, and that's because according to Plesner, we are reflective beings. So we are beings that have to find this balance, but we can also reflect on finding this balance. We kind of exist at a distance from ourselves and we can start asking like, wait a minute, what does this mean? And what does this mean for me? And how should I orient myself now? Um, so, so we have this possibility. At the same time, Plesner says, we will never fully know uh, uh, who we are. We will never fully uh, be able to uh, uh, know the truth of how to find this balance all the time, right? So. In the end, we are reflective beings, but we will never fully know how, uh, how to live. It kind of just has to happen. And um, this is because we're constantly changing, right? So as a human, you're never fully defined, but there's just con you, you are a possibility. Things will, uh, you're, you're basically, as Plessner says, a sign the möglichkeit. So uh, a living possibility as a human being. Um, and this is why the question of who you are, that, you know, lies at the core of who we are, because we constantly have to find this balance in being and having a body, has to be asked over and over and over again. Um, I put in this uh, little cartoon uh, of Rick and Morty in which Rick has built a robot and the robot asks Rick, like, what is my purpose? And uh, this is something that, according to Plesner, only humans would ask, right? Because only we have this reflective capability. Uh, robots don't have this distance from themselves. And then Rick says, uh, you pass butter 
and the robot gets this existential crisis like oh my god what what is this um and this is something that you could never say to a human being you could never just say like okay you know this is your purpose and that's it right you can never be fully known because there's always this possibility there's always yeah an openness basically in who we are um yeah and i just wanted to discuss one more case in which um a medical change medical uh, uh impact can actually change the way in which people think about themselves just to illustrate it a bit more so we had the heart transplant of nancy um and a research that I thought was very interesting is a research uh, done by Slotman. She's a philosopher who focuses very much on these topics about uh, disfiguring breast cancer. So that's basically women who lost a breast uh, due to breast cancer. Often they had to amputate one or two breasts. And uh, recently it became possible for um, a reconstructive surgery to immediately take place uh, when your breast is amputated uh, and many doctors and people thought oh my god this is amazing every woman will want this basically because you know they make you look as much as possible as you did before um, and interesting here is that the idea of what makes a body complete or whole is very much based on looks so very much based on making you look the same way um, and what was fascinating is that some women actually uh, told the doctors like no I, I, I don't want this reconstructive surgery I, I feel more like myself with the scar than with this new breast um, and uh, Slotman concludes from this that this whole experience of who you are, which is intertwined with oneness and strangeness, varies very much from person to person. Uh, so it's very, it's very personal. And, and secondly, it can change over life. Because those women beforehand, uh, be, before they got cancer, they didn't necessarily feel like this breast was too much, right? Like it had to be amputated. But afterwards, they they feel more whole without the reconstruction than with it so it can change like what how how you think about yourself and how you think that you are complete even though that might be a very um difficult and long process of course right it's not at all easy to identify with the body after uh, something like this has happened um, but i think that this is very interesting in light of plesner showing that you know this this balance of life and Kerber is, is disturbed at that moment and that prompts people to actually identify with their body in a different way. Um, lastly, I would like to say something about how Plesner thinks about the self and the other. Because that's, I mean, now I've been talking a lot about, you know, your own body, right? And how you yourself are always a bit strange already and what that means for your own identity but it's very interesting to kind of broaden this and, and say okay but what does that mean for how we relate to other human beings or even other beings in general right um so what's fascinating with plesner is that you that this division that descartes would maybe make like the self is familiar and the other is the stranger um that division cannot be upheld anymore because we already saw right that we are always a bit strange to ourselves that's firstly because we have to uh, constantly find a balance between life and Kerber and we can reflect on ourselves as beings who have to find this balance and as beings who encounter problems in their lives um, so we always have a bit of a, a distance towards ourselves uh, secondly the other person is not a total stranger because I mean, I, I recognize something in that person. We are both human beings. We both have this relationship between having and being a body and we, we recognize each other. We share a world with each other, with, which Plesner calls Midwelt. So we, we, our bond is very much based on this, yeah, weird balance that constantly has to be found between strangeness and familiarity um and 
this sh sh uh, sharing a way of being, we don't only do it human beings, of course. I mean, even though human beings is more familiar to me than the plant, um, a plant is a li living being too. And so are animals. So basically I can recognize and to a certain moment, yeah, in, in German you would say verstehen and in Dutch verstaan. Uh, you can, it, it's a bit different from understanding, but in a way you can have a feeling of what it means to be another living being because you're both sharing a way of being. Um, and this is something that Marjorie Green summarizes in her uh, discussion of Plessner. Uh, she says that the detachment and the very nothingness that constitutes a person. So what she means by this is that the fact that we can reflect and distance our, ourselves from ourselves is the power he has of putting himself in the place of any other person, indeed of any other living thing. So here you see that this strangeness and familiarity is not only relevant on a personal identity level, but also on the level of relating to other people or beings in the world. Yeah, now we have had all the philosophers. I will discuss uh, a film uh, by Claire Denis. Uh, she basically makes a sort of narrative uh, out of Nancy's essay, but it's very different from uh, what Nancy is doing. So she really gives her own interpretation to it. And the movie is basically very much about crossing borders all the time. Basically the first shot is already of a border guard uh, trying to see if somebody's actually smuggling dr drugs from one country to the other. So it's very much about, you know, the stranger, stranger constantly breaking in and where is the border. Uh, it's also about skin and about skin being broken, about scars that show that the skin has been broken, about bodies. Also about dreams and reality at a certain moment, you really don't know if you're looking at a dream or reality anymore. Um, also about family, right? It's often associated with the most familiar people around you, but the characters here are very estranged from their family and about loneliness. Um, basically it tells the story of uh, this guy called um, uh, Lovi. He's played by uh, um, uh, Michel Trebor. And uh, Lovi is a very unsympathetic guy. So it's a bit difficult to uh, maybe empathize with them, which is, of course, done on purpose. And he discovers after a while that he has heart problems. He gets a heart attack while he is um, uh, swimming. And then he decides to have an illegal heart transplant. And here the movie quite clearly divides from, uh, departs from what Nancy is doing, right? Because Nancy, of course, it's a whole legal procedure. But this guy is literally emailing some Russian company like, yeah, I want, I want a heart. And I want a heart from a young person, he says. Um, and what's really interesting visually is that... Um, you of course have the main character Lovi, and often in films and books the main character is also the point of view character so the person that basically through his or her eyes you see the world um but in this movie we actually we're not seeing it through his eyes we are constantly spying on him there is actually this woman the russian woman that sells the heart to him already from the beginning she's constantly behind a tree or somewhere like just following him around she comes into his dreams so we are actually constantly spying on him and that makes uh, uh us ask this question like okay who, who is the intruder here maybe it's us as the people who view this movie um and at the same time uh the lovey character very much seems like an intruder in every scene he doesn't seem like he belongs there at all um, and this uh, uh, picture on the background is a still from the movie. Uh, it's also one of the most telling images, I think. Um, it's these two characters, uh, Louis in the background and his friend Henri on the, in the front. And they are carrying Louis's mattress from the beach to a little island. And um, the bed is constantly shown in the movie. 
Um, and interestingly, I mean, the bed is often this place that's really this familiar place, right? You're safe there, you can sleep there, you make love there. Um, and here, there's cons it's actually a space for really creepy dreams. Um, so this familiarity is already questioned. And what they do is basically carrying this very intimate space, they're carrying it across this border of water. So there you already see that what is familiar and strange is constantly moving as well. Um, then I want to show you the short trailer of the movie. Um, be careful that the sound of your computer is not too hard because it's some electronic intense music that will come. Um, yeah, so now I would like to go in some ethical implications. I mean, the, the movie never addresses them directly, but visually implicates that they're there. Uh, on the background, by the way, you see Nancy together with, uh, with uh, Denis. Um, they, they had quite a lot of contact about the, the making the movie and apparently Nancy felt really involved, right? Because it was quite a personal story for him. So when he met uh, Trebor, he showed him his scar and Trebor was super impressed by that. Um, but what they want to uh, show, I think, in the movie is that this intrusion is always there and that it does raise interesting uh, ethical questions. And the first one is about uh, borders and countries, right? I mean, it's also made quite explicit by showing this border guard and uh, the daughter-in-law of Louis is also somebody guarding a border. Um, but what is interesting is that during his travels, Louis sees a lot of refugees constantly going into the bushes and trying to not be caught. Um, and often if we talk about uh, issues about countries and borders, uh, refugees are often portrayed as the strangers, right? The, the intruders, the invaders. Um, but what this movie is doing is that the main character, Louis, seems so um, strange that it is almost as if he is invading their country. So basically the movie kind of constantly switches around and then switches back the idea of who is a stranger in this scene. You, I think in the trailer you also see him looking at some people in the truck, right? And they're both looking at each other and spying on each other. So yeah, that's one really interesting uh, uh, issue that it raises. And uh, the movie also talks very much about family and estrangement, estrangement from that family. Um, Louis lives quite close to his son but doesn't have any idea what this guy is doing with his life. All of a sudden he finds out they have a kid and he's like, oh, is that a girl? And they're like, no, it's a boy and he's named after you. And it's really embarrassing. Um, and it's quite painful. And then after he has the heart transplant, he starts actually looking for his other son that he had probably made somewhere else. And he is constantly trying to find him, but he's constantly actually referred back home to the son that is over there and that he's estranged from. Uh, so constantly it's already shown that, you know, the, the, the person that you are looking for, that you want to connect with might already be very close to you. Um, and then the movie is also about this impossibility of getting rid of strangeness. And um, what is fascinating is that Louis is, I, I told you, right? He's at the beginning, he says, I want the heart of a young person. But after that, he gets haunted by ideas that somebody might have been killed for this heart. Uh, and he, there is a dream sequence in which you actually see him killing someone. Uh, he kills this woman who is outside of this house and then he buries her under the eyes. Um, and after he goes uh, uh, away to having that heart uh, transplant, that woman starts sneaking around his house. She finds the dead body, which is herself, and then she breaks into his house. So she is constantly intruding in this place which is most familiar. And e even after she's killed, she remains there being intrusive into his life. And this is also something that uh, Nancy emphasizes very much, is that we cannot avoid these questions about strangeness and ownness, right? It's not simply uh, a matter of 
taking this strange element and taking it up in your body and then it's great no it's actually uh, the, the, he basically says at a certain moment in the essay that the coming of the strange will not cease he will just remain there and keep on intruding into your body um and lastly i i would like to attach this to uh questions that people often ask about um uh, country borders and if you should let people in or not and you have sometimes you have this i think in the discussion really extreme camps that manifest themselves there's this one uh on one hand people who say well no we cannot let anybody in because um you know uh, this is who we are and this is the border of the country and they are different from us right um and what these people are doing is essentially saying that the border is static and that it's essentially there and that it cannot be changed and that there's an essential difference um on the other hand you also sometimes have people who say oh we shouldn't even you know there shouldn't even be borders and with that i don't mean that i necessarily think there should be country borders or something but i mean that um that the question of where you draw a line of who to include and who to exclude is not a question that could be avoided because it lies at the core of, of who we are as human beings. Um, and this is also something that Nancy uh, says in his essay. He actually says that the idea of the stranger might go a bit against our whole idea of moral or even political correctness. And he writes at the beginning of his essay that the theme of the entru or the intruder is inextricable from the truth of the stranger since moral correctness assumes that one receives the stranger by effacing his strangeness at the threshold it would just never have us receive him but the stranger insists and breaks in this is what is not easy to receive or perhaps conceive so the idea is that you know inviting this strange element in doesn't mean that it's immediately familiar right it, it you have to deal with it constantly. So I think the two conclusions we can draw here is that, yeah, it's, it's in, we cannot avoid questioning about what is familiar and strange uh, in relation to who we are. And also that this is again Plessner, right? That is because of this strangeness in ourselves and the fami familiarity of others that we can put ourselves in the place of other living beings. Yeah. That was it, actually. I have here a list of um, uh, things that I, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sources that I used. Uh, and I will also put this whole um, presentation in the Google Drive. I think Sabina has probably in the chat shared uh, a link to the Google Drive in which I have uh, put recommended readings and, and other, other things. If you're interested in a film mentioned by Femke, the links and the documents Femke is referring to, please visit futurebase.org. We have shared the Google Drive where you can find all the articles and information on this lecture. If you're interested in the 60 minutes back to the future concept, please reach out to me at sabina at futurebase.org or visit futurebase.org. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>